Hi guys, Chris here and welcome to my i7 book review. So it's Cube's latest tablet. It looks very similar to the i7 stylus, but it does have a new keyboard dock, a new chipset, which is now the Intel Skylake Core M36Y30. Has the same 4GB of RAM, 64GB SSD. It also has wireless AC now, which is really good to see the dual band wireless coming into these flagship tablets. We were missing that last year. And it also has a USB 3.1 Type-C port that first showed up in the Cube i9. So it has now moved over to the i7 book here. Just to show you on the side here, we have DCN for charging, a micro USB 3 port, that's the Type-C port, and a micro SD card slot, which I can confirm supports up to 128 gigabyte SSDs. So the build of it isn't too bad. The keyboard is metal and it only reclines here about 120 degrees, which isn't the greatest, but it's an indefinite step up from the fixed keyboard that the i7 stylus has. And along the back, it is made out of a alloy there that is quite easy to scratch. And we do have the speakers on the right side only. Unfortunately, Cube did not update that design. On the keyboard dock, we have USB 2 ports either side. And the top along here is plastic for re improved reception there for the wireless AC, which does have dual antennas. There's a rear 5 megapixel camera, and on the front, a front-facing 2 megapixel camera. So let's have a look at the tablet now in greater detail. So the keyboard is a revised new dock that is a transformer style. We get some little rubber feet here to help keep the screen from rubbing up against the keyboard here and the keyboard is very rigid I'm pushing down quite hard there and there is no flex whatsoever there's no bounce there's good travel on the keys you get approximately 1.3 millimeters of travel and I find they are spaced out nicely we do have a button right here to disable the trackpad now the trackpad is still small and I find it often end up triggering the Windows minimize gesture at the top there and I find that to be quite annoying Unfortunately, there is no settings there to be able to disable that, which is um, unfortunate. Hopefully that will come later on with driver updates, but there is a workaround that you can actually do a bit of a hack to the registry to disable gestures. And the tablet, it's very easy to dock. It just clips in, magnets help pull it into place, and it will dock in like so. There's a nice little gap there that you can touch the Windows Home button, and there's a little tiny haptic feedback motor in there. It will give a small vibration too once you push the Windows button there. Now you can flip it around and also dock it in, which is a little harder. When you do that, you can use it in what's called like a presentation mode. So you can hold it up like that and watch a movie on it, for example, as a stand. And because it has that 10 pin pogo port design, you can still use the USB 2 ports either side and even the trackpad, which is unusual. So the screen it uses is a Samsung 1080p screen and it's the same screen that was used in the i7 Stylus and also the Microsoft Surface Pro 2. Very good screen in terms of brightness, well it gets up to 419 lux which is quite bright. You'll be able to make it out in the shade outdoors and sunlight still will struggle a little there with the reflections being the fact that this is a non-laminated display. There is a small gap between the digitizer glass and the IPS below but it's not so obvious like in other models. Blacks are good, whites are good. The calibration of the screen I find to be excellent. Accuracy as well and how fluid the screen is with the focal tech digitizer that it has on there is excellent and no problems at all with it. Now it does support a Wacom stylus and you can get this, it's an optional extra. So you do have an eraser tip on one end and then the other tips on the end. Now the tips of the stylus is that they do include uh, plastic so they don't have a rubber end to them. So they don't feel as good as a note uh, four or five stylus, for example, that does have rubber on the end, but you can still use that. Being Wacom, you can actually get away with using a Note 5 stylus or any other Wacom stylus. So I'm going to go into OneNote right here now and just give you a quick demonstration of the palm rejection. So here I'm going to try and write hello. So you can see now it hovers. There's a little icon there just to let you know that you're hovering where your, your pointer is. The accuracy of the pointer isn't bad at all. You see what happened then, how it just went down? Because the edge of my palm just touched around here. So the palm rejection tends to only work just in the middle. So if I move my finger here, you can see that it's not moving or scrolling around on the page. But as soon as I move the stylus to about here, onto the edges, then I'm allowed to do that. Now this apparently is a problem with Windows 10 and something to do with the drive support 
and the way that Windows 10 is configured because uh, they they want you to be able to swipe still left and right to get access to the charm. So software only hopefully is this problem and, and it is hopefully going to be fixable, but I can't be certain about that. So writing on it, if you're in the middle there, you just have to be a little bit careful with your palms. I find that if you do put example OneNote here in, in full screen, then you're able to write a little faster here. So I'm just going to do another test again. Uh, how I was supposed to write, how are you? But you see there, my palm was touching. But if you write right in the middle there, it isn't ideal and not really that practical. So it is running Windows 10 and that is of course 64-bit. We have full access to all of the 4 gigabytes of RAM that it has on there and Windows activated without any problems. Now just to show you in the device manager that the disk drive that it has is a 64 gigabyte drive. You get approximately 46 gigabytes free on it when you first boot it up and the wireless here we have a wireless AC from Intel which is something that is new to these tablets. Nobody ever only had single band on there. So we are finally starting to see in 2016. It's well overdue dual band AC. And in the chipset is the Intel dual band wireless AC 3165, which performs quite well. I will get onto benchmarks now and just show you how fast that actually is. Here we have the benchmarks. So the first one of the first ones I'll just show you here is the Geekbench 3 score. Now that's not a bad score for the chipset. And the, the wireless speeds. Here they are. So the range I found is really good, excellent. I can go downstairs furthest away from my router and be able to pick up and get good speeds. Now testing this same location with my desktop, I get approximately the same speeds, more or less about the same. It all depends on the, the network load. Unfortunately, because I'm connected up, you can see here uh, via Orange, and that is actually just a 4G connection. That is the fastest I can get where I'm located. So that can fluctuate a little bit, but all in all, the speeds are excellent, really good, and I haven't had any problems at all with it. Bluetooth as well works really good. So some of the other benchmarks I ran, for example, um, Istrom Extreme 1.2. I'm going to quickly go through these. Cloudgate 1.1. Uh, here is Istrom 1.2 score. Now, I haven't tried to cheat or anything to get these really good scores, but what I have done is let the tablet cool down, and I have been running it in the high-performance mode. So I let it cool down between the benchmarks because the more you run this benchmark, if I was to keep repeating 3D Mark 11 over and over again, the scores will just keep going lower and lower and lower as the tablet starts to heat up. And later, well, it's a little bit random too because here you can see I got a really crazy score for this chipset. Okay, compared to your desktop, this is a horrible score, but for a fanless tablet, it's quite good. Uh, so PC Mark 7 score also very good. Uh, the pass mark score gets, uh, where are we, 1845. And lastly, 3D Mark 11, a performance score of 1051, which is very low compared to your gaming desktop, but for this chipset, not bad at all. Temperatures is what I want to show you now. So this is really the Achilles heel of this tablet, because although you get that really, really good those performance there, you can see well, this is what happened. So it got up to uh, 97 degrees on the GPU and the CPU package there. But it was actually, the CPU cores got up to 93. It didn't trigger any thermal throttling. So Cube have allowed to, to basically get this as hot as you want, but as fast as you want, really. You could, it's very fast. Now these temperatures only happen when you actually put the tablet in performance mode and you disable any power saving features on the GPU. There's a setting in the Intel GPU there that you can put onto extended gaming, uh, extended battery life for gaming. If you disable that, then this is the, the scores you get that I just showed you. It increases the 3D performance drastically, but that is the problem, how hot it gets. So definitely a candidate for my thermal mod, I think, to help improve the thermals on it. So performance in general is very quick. This happens to be, I think, the fastest Core M3 that I have tested to date. It is very quick, very snappy. Everything pops up quick. Scrolling, this is Chrome. Core M's handle all this quite well. And the fact that we do have a full SSD, that also helps. We've got no restricted EMMC drives like the Atom tablets. And it just goes so quick. Multitasking handles it really well, everything there. So I'll show you, lastly, the speeds of the internal storage. 
you'll see here that um, they're nothing wonderful, but definitely quicker than your average Atom tablet. A lot quicker, up to five times here on the reads and the writes. Not bad at all, the 4Ks. Uh, this is a external, this is a USB 3 drive. And unfortunately, you have to use the adapter to use the USB 3 port, as well as the Type-C port. You're going to need adapters there. But it does get and offer full speeds, and all of the ports, external ports, and the USB 2 ports on the, the keyboard dock will power external hard drives. And the micro SD card slot I noticed was only functioning and working in around USB 2 speed, so not as fast as it could be this card. That card that I tested out is a, a Samsung 128GB Pro Plus card. It does detect it as well, the system. So a quick 4K test here in Edge. You can see that uh, that is set to 4K and it dropped only one frame and has about 10 seconds there of buffer. So very good. No problems with that. I'm going to try the same test here now in Chrome. And Chrome isn't very good at streaming 4K. If you try this on an Atom, it just really grinds to a halt. You only get about 5 frames per second. So that's on HD. And I'll put that now to 2160. Full screen, enable the stats. And have a look now. So it's still buffering and no drop frames though, which is a surprise. Okay, we've got one drop frame. That's not too bad. So even in Chrome, it's streaming this quite fine, quite smooth. Okay, 10 drop frames now. It is dropping frames, but it's a lot better than the Atom tablets. So as mentioned in the beginning of the video that it does have a USB 3.1 Type-C port on it right here. And I have used a variety of hubs on there, and they all work. And you can actually charge via the Type-C port. Right here I have an iVolva 75 watt charger, and this outputs up to 12, well, 12 volts, 3 amps, and that is enough to actually charge it and use it. So you can pretty much use this as a, a one port docking solution because with this AU key hub that I have, a Type-C hub here, we have HDMI out and there is the input there for charging as well as four USB 3 ports and it's working just fine. I did notice though that sometimes the output with HDMI has been a little bit flaky with this. Sometimes there's been a bit of a flicker but whereas when I've used a straight Type-C port to HDMI, that has worked fine and flawlessly the HDMI out. So not really too sure what is up with that. It could be something to do with this hub. And another type of hub that I've tried here also worked, which is just a standard uh, Type-C in for charging HDMI out and one USB 3 port. That also works. So with all the ports on the left hand side here, it seems that Cube, the designers didn't have room to put the speakers on either side. Unfortunately, it's exactly the same layout as the i7 stylus. So we have the two speakers here. I'm gonna do a little quick test now so I can put the volume up to 100% and we'll have a listen to how it sounds. Hi guys, Chris here and welcome to my review of the Yumi Super. So this is a MediaTek Helio P10 powered mobile phone with four gigabytes of RAM. Let's have a look at... Now I'll listen to a quick sample of music. I would rate the speakers as below average. They just aren't really loud enough. So if you're in a noisy environment and perhaps you're playing an audio track there of someone talking, you might struggle to actually hear them. Good thing is, of course, we do have a 3.5 millimeter headphone jack. It supports microphones and the output, unlike the speakers, is loud and very clear too. There's no static on there. So how is the battery life? Unfortunately, it's not wonderful. You can get around four and a half to five hours with 50% screen brightness and surfing the web, watching some YouTube videos, which is what I've been doing here. You can see that I have been running it since 99% and almost one hour, and it's now at approximately 80%. So every 30 minutes of use, you lose about 10% battery there. Best case scenario that you could put it into flight mode, you could dim it down to 25% brightness and just watch movies, then I think you can squeeze around six hours out of it. So synthetic benchmarks are one thing. Let's see how it performs with a proper game benchmark and some gaming tests. So first up, I'm going to test out a Resident Evil 5 benchmark. So I'm going to run the fixed benchmark in DirectX 9 and see how it performs. So I'm just going to go with the default settings that it first booted up with. You can see along here as well, the frames per second, memory use, and most importantly to the temperature. 
So I'm going to run the fixed benchmark. Alright, so here is the result, almost 24 frames per second, a C ranking, which isn't brilliant if you compare that to a gaming PC, but it's not actually too bad for a fanless Core M tablet. So this is Counter-Strike Global Offensive running in 720p, lower settings, show you them very quickly here. So everything's on low, 720p, see how it runs. I must warn you that I am very bad at this game. So we see it's uh, hopping around 60, 70 frames per second, which isn't bad at all. And I died. So it's tipping down to about 40 the lowest there, but I would definitely consider this one to be playable. Half-Life 2, The Lost Coast, running in 1080p, high settings. It's just managing to get around 24 frames per second. I'll quickly show you the settings. So you see model details on high, texture detail high, and the shader high. And try and linear filtering is the only thing I just turned down. So it, it seems playable at 1080p anyway, this game. Next title is Call of Duty Modern Warfare 3. Show you the video settings. So those are the settings I'm going to use here. You can of course lower this down to 720p, it'll probably run a better. But at the moment it's 30 frames per second. And the last game I'm going to test out is League of Legends and just the sub is Rift map with one bot on my side, two on the opposition. This is the normal test I do on these tablets. Okay, so the game has just started but already over 100 frames per second, 1080p on medium settings there. So that's not bad at all, very good. So this game is going to be 100% playable I think. And moving around the map, very fluid and smooth, as you can see. And the frame rate is great. Temperature is getting a little warm now, up to almost 90 degrees, 89 degrees at the moment. So now with a bit more on the screen, the frame rate is still about 90 frames per second. Very good results there. So let's have a look at the temperatures. So looking in Intel Extreme Tuning, utility we can see that uh, it gets up there you can see peaking at actually 97 degrees so that is really too warm but most of the time it stayed around 90 gaming now I don't have the best conditions here because I do have the tablet lying flat down on the table so it's not dissipating as much heat as it probably could but we see there that uh, in terms of power limit throttling or thermal throttling nothing there so, oh, there was actually power limit throttling happening, sorry, you can see there, so that bar at the top. So it is limiting the power a little there. So thermals, let's have a look now with my thermal probe, just after gaming and see how hot it is getting. So 45 degrees on the front of the glass, and on the rear I can feel, just before, that it's, it's starting to get quite hot. 
and that is around 45 as well. So very warm to the touch, actually up to 46.4 there. But bear that in mind, as I just mentioned, that it has been against a table. For a tablet, the cameras take an okay photo. So we've got a rare 5 megapixel camera with autofocus. So you can take macro shots of text, for example. The front facing camera is okay quality. It's good enough for Skype. And here's just a couple of samples here. It's a little grainy, this outdoor shot. But you'd probably be honestly better off using your mobile phone to take any decent photos. But if you did have no other camera with you, then you could get away with, yes, taking some photo of some text or notes. A quick look at Remix running on it. I can confirm that the wireless is working. Now, the copy that I downloaded, the ISO image, is one that has some additional things added to it, additional drivers. This is from XDA forums. And you can see here that uh, the touch is working and the battery seems to be detected. Sound, I'm not too sure about. I haven't actually had any sound come out of the speakers yet. And wireless, connect up to wireless, it's just fine. So in the stylus, you can see it's also working. So that is an added bonus there. So good to see that it can run Remix, but I installed it on the micro SD card slot. So it's a little slow, not running at the full speed. And you probably have to try to find a way to install it on the hard drive. Now I did try the hard drive install, but it didn't come up with the operating system selector at the beginning. So I do think there will be a way to run definitely dual boot on this tablet. So you'll be able to run Windows 10 and Remix, which is really good. So after using the i7 book now for a week, I can confirm that the performance of it is exceptional. It is probably one of the fastest Core M3s that I have tested to date. But that does come at a cost of those very high temperatures that it can reach when you push it hard gaming or benchmarking or doing any task demanding for long periods. It will get hot to the touch and it reaches temperatures that really shouldn't be happening in this kind of form factor without any fans. The keyboard is great to type on, the wireless AC performance is very good, I find the screen's good, the Wacom stylus support is an additional bonus, but there is a slight problem with the palm rejection that doesn't seem to work on the outer edges of the screen. Despite those cons there, I still find this probably has to be one of the best 2-in-1s you can get out of China, and definitely one of the best with the stylus support. Thank you for watching this review, and hopefully I will see you back in the channel soon. Bye for now.